Good morning. Uh, before I uh, minister the word this morning, we have something else that's very important, and we're very delighted this morning to uh, be able to dedicate a very, well, it's not a new life. She's been around for a few months now, but a very precious life. And so uh, we're going to dedicate Charity Dot Iceland to the Lord this morning. And uh, if Charity would bring her parents and anybody else that you would like to have come, grandparents, uh, uncles, aunts, whoever, if you'd like to come, please come. Charlotte, if you'd come, please, and help me. Come right on up here. Would you do that? You just push this back just like this. If y'all could just stand right here. Come on up here, guys, okay? He says, I'm not sure I want to go on that stage. We live in the age of many photos. Charlotte was showing me a photo this morning of a man dying, he's got, or not drowning, he's got his hand raised, and everybody on the bank's got their iPhone out for him, like this. You know, he's drowning, and they're just taking a picture of that one hand. He's just, you know, that's kind of how we are. This is a special time, a special day, and, uh, you know, uh, a man and a woman having a baby is a direct result of the blessing that God bestowed on the first human being. He said, be fruitful, be, uh, he said, be blessed, now be fruitful, and multiply. And so, charity is a direct blessing from God to you. Always remember that. Now, there'll be days that you'll wonder about that, okay? You know, as it gets a little tough sometimes. So is Dayton, so is Aubrey. So this whole family is a blessing. And you know, the precedent of the ceremony of uh, baby dedication is really found, or may be found, in the uh, presentation of Samuel to God by his mother. 1 Samuel one twenty eight where she brought him to the Lord and gave him to the Lord. She had already promised him to the Lord, but then she gave him back to him. And that's really what we're doing this morning. We're giving charity back to the Lord, for his blessing, for his power, and for his protection. Uh, Jesus also said, consider the little children and, 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 and let them come to me. And you're bringing charity to Jesus this morning, for his hand to rest upon, for his grace to be bestowed. The purpose of baby dedication is to be really found in the purpose of the parents. For by bringing your child into dedication, parents are signifying their faith in God. You don't have a whole lot to depend upon in this world. But one thing you can depend upon, charity belongs to Jesus. And he's going to watch over them. Uh, they also indicate their desire that their children come to know Christ at a very early age. And that's our prayer today, is that charity will find Jesus very early in her life. We don't want Charity to have a testimony of being delivered from a whole bunch of stuff. We want Charity to have the testimony, I didn't have to go there because Jesus is my Lord and my Savior and I accepted Him at an early age. The act of dedication will not make Charity a Christian today, but it will make her cognizant as you infuse into her life the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. It will make her cognizant of her dependency upon you know, rightly understood, the ceremony of dedication by the parents is that you are pledging yourself. And you're really trying to obey the command of Paul that says, Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the, nature, in, in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord. This ceremony is really meaningless unless the parents dedicate themselves to the Lord and then dedicate themselves to their daughter to teach her the ways of Jesus. And so... To the Father, to Brandon, I say this. It's your responsibility to provide not only the material needs for your family, but also the spiritual cover for this entire family. In the Bible, a man was called the priest of the household. At the Passover feast, it was the father who was to go out and put the blood above the door and on either side of the door to make sure his family was covered by the blood of the lamb. And 
That's your job, Brenda, to provide that covering for your family. And so in, in remembrance of this very significant and awesome role that you have, I want to give you this one, this rose, this red rose. The red signifies the blood of Jesus Christ who covers your family and who is your strength and your source. You'll be called upon to correct, to guide, and to live a Christian example for charity from this point on all the days of school. It's not just what is a child, but all the days of school. You must protect her as she grows to a beautiful young lady, and then you have to let her go, which is the hardest part of all. But the safety and provision of these lives are in your hands, and even as you let her go someday, you know that you've done your best and that God will save you. And so if you'll accept these challenges, Brendan, would you just simply answer with God's help? To the mother, Tracy, you, you will be the primary example of Jesus in Charity's life. She'll learn so much to your need because you'll be with her most of the time. And as you interact with her daily, she'll look to you for love, for security, for care, and for grace. She should only see tenderness and gentleness and a pure and right relationship in your life with your Lord. And in remembrance of your role this morning, I want to give you this pure white rose. This symbolizes, of course, that what you do and what you teach should be always with the purity and the holiness of Jesus Christ in view. And if you'll accept this challenge to raise charity in the holiness and in the purity of Jesus, would you simply say, with God's help, I will. And you know, congregation, we have a responsibility. This family belongs to us. This family is part of the body. And so we have a responsibility to pray, to encourage, to give a right example of love and purity in our lives so that charity can see Christ in us and will follow us as we follow Christ. So, congregation, if you will accept the challenge of being part of the body that will show charity, the true image of Jesus, would you stand with me this morning? Then also, I want to do one more thing. I want to present to you this little bud. It's yet to be unfolded. We don't know what it's going to look like yet. But we know that God created it. We know it's pretty. And I give this bud to you this morning as an example of charity. Her life is still to unfold. I don't know what God's going to do with this baby. She may be another great woman that goes across the world, like Lillian Thrasher, who raised up a great orphanage many years ago, or perhaps uh, like some of the other great women in, in Scripture that did great things. A Deborah, I don't know. But God knows. So this morning, if you will take this, this tender rose, please treat Charity's life as tender and with extreme care. And she doesn't eat it before you get home. You can make a, a, a bouquet out of this. Let the sunshine of Jesus shine upon Charity's life and let it unfold in all of its beauty and all of its holiness. This morning, I want to pray over Charity. That's right. Hey. Oh, goodness. Let's get there and learn how to do this. Years ago, on the first baby dedication I ever did, uh, the baby had a little sister. She was older, and she ran up to me that morning and said, Pastor, are you going to decorate our baby this morning? And I said, No, I'm going to dedicate her. God did the decorating. And God did a pretty good job of decorating this one, don't you think? Mom, Dad, would you come and lay hands upon your, your baby? Grandma, grandpas, uncles, whoever, would you lay hands upon as well? Congregation, would you extend your hand this morning? Father, I thank you for charity today. I thank you, Father, for life, for the hallowedness 
of allowing us to not only create a baby, but to create, Lord, another soul for your kingdom and for your glory. Now, Father, I pray for charity. I pray, Lord, that you would crown her with grace and beauty and honor all the days of her life. I pray, Father, you would protect her. Father, I pray that you would lead her and guide her. I pray that at an early age, she'll accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I pray, Father, that at an early age, she'll be filled with your Spirit. I pray, Father, that as she goes through life, she'll never forget that you are her God and that she belongs to you. And, Father, whatever you have in store for this baby, I pray, Lord, that you will do your work in marvelous and magnificent ways. And, Heavenly Father, her life will shine to a lost world as a great beacon of God's love and mercy in her life. And, Father, just take her now and bless her. In Jesus' name, in everybody's name, amen. Praise God. So I give this baby back to you to raise in the fear of the admonition of the Lord. I also uh, want to give to you a certificate of dedication. You can take that and, and use that. Also, the church presents to you this morning a, a blanket as a covering for this baby. So always whenever you take this blanket and put it on charity, just remember that she is covered by the love and the prayers of this congregation. Okay? And then there's a little gift here uh, and that you know, the church has given. We also have a Bible that's coming. It's not here yet. It's coming. It's going to be her Bible. Dedication. Okay? God bless you all. Let's give this family a applause this morning. Amen. God bless you. Thank you much. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. This morning, let me uh, just say some thanksgivings uh, to some folks. Uh, number one, I want to say thank you to uh, Lyle Jones for uh, building in the pulpit while I was gone. I've heard good reports. It's always good whenever you hear good reports while you're gone. And uh, I understand he did a marvelous job of ministering the Word both Sunday, last Sunday and Wednesday night. Thank you for, for doing that. For a while. I appreciate that so much. Also, let me just thank you for uh, all of the prayers that, were, that have been given for my brother. And uh, uh, let me just let you know that he is in a room. Wednesday, I didn't know if, if I would even be able to come back and uh, without having to, first of all, attend his funeral. I'll be honest. He was very, very sick. But your prayers have helped. And so thank you for praying. He's in a room. He's doing better. We believe he's going to make a full recovery. And uh, thank you so much for that. Amen. And just thanks for being here today. Amen. You look good. And it's good to be back in cool Alaska. Uh, I was in Houston, Texas, where the humidity, where the, the temperature was 90 and the humidity was 100, and and uh, it's nice to be back where there's a little snow on the mountains. Praise God, and it won't be long. Matter of fact, Charlotte told me that it's snowing in Eagle River today. And what are you trying to tell me, dear? Oh, excuse me, we do have some guests with us this morning. Thank you, dear, that I do want to recognize. I put this so I'd see it, and I didn't see it. Uh, we have uh, Vicky and Ron Guthrie. Along with their children, Alex, Ronald, Kimberty, Kimberty, is that right? And then uh, Talisha. Where is the uh, the Guthrie family? Right there. God bless you. Let's just give them a, a thanksgiving for being here today. God bless you. Thank you for being a part of this service today. Amen. Also, it's uh, good to have uh, Rob and uh, and uh, uh, well, I just now lost the name. Therese, thank you. I'm glad you remembered. <laughs> Back with us after their extended stay in, in Homer with uh, with business down there. And, and if you are been gone, it's good to have uh, Hank back with us, I think, as well. And if, you, if you've been gone and you've just come back, God bless you. Thank you for being here today. I uh, want us to continue this morning with the sermon series that we've been talking about which is being completely Christian in a pagan world. And that will be up on the screen there, I think, in just a moment, perhaps, maybe, there it is. Being completely Christian in a pagan world. 
You know, in the latter half of chapter 3 of Paul's letter to the first Corinthians, the letter that we call first Corinthians, Paul deals with two primary issues. And these two issues are very much joined together. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The two issues that Paul deals with are the building of the church and the motivation of those who help build it. Now, Jesus declared in Matthew 16 and 18, I will build my church. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I wish we could have been there that day because I think it would have been more clear to us what Jesus was really saying. Peter had just made his great confession of faith. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus looked at Peter, and Peter's name means little stone. Actually, it means a chip off of the bigger rock. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, Peter, you're, you're, the, you're a little rock. But if we could have been there that day, I think we would have seen Jesus do something like this. And then he would have said, but upon this rock, I think he pointed to himself. You're a little stone, Peter, but upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. It's your confession of faith in me as Master and Lord and Savior that is the foundation of the church. Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. No man can stand up against the fury of, of hell unless God is on his side and God's strength is within him. Our foundation is not upon a Peter. Our foundation is upon the rock of ages. Amen. Hallelujah. So that's what Jesus was saying. Upon this rock, I will build my church. That verse of Scripture perhaps should be on the screen. Matthew 16 and 18. There it is. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. You see, Jesus is responsible for the building of the church. Jesus is the foundation upon which the church is to be built. But Jesus uses human tools to help build it. So let's look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 10. Paul says, What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants, through whom you came to believe, as the Lord, as the Lord has assigned each, to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you, talking to the church, you are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But, here's the key, each one should be careful how he builds. Now, as we've already discussed, the Corinthians were choosing sides as to who was the best preacher and they were trying to rely upon human wisdom to benefit and to build a church. And Paul declares to them that, that their division that they were having, some were saying, I follow Paul, and I follow Apollos, and I follow Peter, and some were even saying, well, we, we got down, all be I follow Christ. Paul says that their division based on human personality and their reliance upon worldly wisdom was nothing but, but just an indication of just how unspiritual they were. You see, they thought they were super spiritual. They thought that they were better than everybody else within the kingdom. They thought that they had inside knowledge and inside insight. But Paul says, no, your divisions and your worldly wisdom that you're trying to execute is nothing but an indication of how unspiritual you really are. Are. You're not super spiritual. You're unspiritual, Paul says. So Paul seeks to change their perception. Paul seeks to change 
is spiritual insight. And he does this first by helping the Corinthians understand the true process of building the church. And Paul begins doing this by taking the spotlight off of human personality, taking the spotlight off of human ingenuity. The church that Jesus is building is a spiritual house. It is a spiritual process. And the foundation of the spiritual house, the spiritual process, cannot be founded upon the fleeting sands of human ability and human understanding. Notice how Paul turns the Corinthians' attention away from thinking that Paul or Apollos or any other human should be followed or put upon a pedestal. Notice what he says, 1 Corinthians 3, 5 again. He says, what? after all, is Apollos. And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. It's an interesting verse of Scripture. Because notice that in that verse, Paul does not ask, who is Apollos? Or who is Paul? Instead, he asked, what is Apollos? What is Paul? You see, when it comes down to leadership, God does not choose certain individuals so that he can make them a who for others to idolize and to follow. He chooses people and gives them assignments or functions, and it is the function that is important. It's not the person. That's good preaching. It's the assignment, the function, not the person. He doesn't say, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? He says, what are we? Because it's not who we are, it's what we are. That's important. You see, unfortunately, some seek a ministry title or a ministry position so that others will applaud them and so that they can have clout and authority and recognition. But that's not the way that Paul says the church of Jesus Christ is to operate. Ministry is not about title. Ministry is about function. Ministry is not about authority. Ministry is about servanthood. That's what a minister of the gospel is to be. is a servant. Not a who, but a what. And notice how Paul refers to himself and Apollos. He says, we are only servants. Do you get that? Only servants. Don't look at us, Paul says. Don't idolize us. We're only servants. We're just a couple of ones. The important one is Jesus. That word, Greek word that's used as servants here is the Greek word diakonoi. Diakonoi means a waiter on tables. It referred to just a common servant in this day and age. No fanfare, nothing to stand out, just a common servant. A de- diakonos, that's the, the plural term, servants. And that word diakonos, which is the singular term, originally meant in the Greek, one who raises dust by hurrying. That's an interesting concept. Because you see, in this culture, Paul is writing to and lives with them. In this culture, important people didn't hurry. If there was any hurrying to be done, the important people had a servant to do it. They hired it done, or they delegated it to be done. Important people didn't hurry. So what Paul is helping the Corinthians to understand here is that when it comes to building the church, He and Apollos were not the important ones. 
We're simply the one who raises dust by hurry. We're not important at all, Paul said. They were merely the servants of Jesus, and Jesus is the one who is important. Jesus is the one to follow. Amen. Now, I know that this sermon series deals with being completely Christian in a pagan world. But may I suggest this morning that sometimes popular Christian culture can mess up true Christianity as well. Just because the Christian world is doing it or saying it doesn't make it so. Our theology and our Christian practice or our Christian way of doing things, our practice, our practice, our theology and our practice must mesh with God's holy word regardless of what the latest popular preacher or teacher or apostle or prophet is saying and doing. I'm going to say it again. Our Christian theology and our Christian practice must be founded upon God's Word. It doesn't make any difference what anybody else is saying or doing in the Christian world. If it's not founded on God's Word, if you can't find it written in the book and documented by the Spirit, then don't follow it. Amen. Honey, you might need to get the car warmed up one more time before this gets over with today. We may have to get a fast getaway. You see, when it comes to theology and when it comes to practice, we must declare sola scriptura, which simply means the scripture alone. The Word of God alone is our all sufficient source, our all sufficient guide for Christian faith and Christian conduct. Don't listen to pop theology. Listen to God's theology that's founded in the book. Amen? Amen. You know, it, so it is with the common Christian practice of placing too much emphasis on title and office. There's a lot of emphasis today being placed on titles and offices within the church. Paul declares that human leadership in the church must be based and motivated by servant leadership. We are only servants, Paul says. Now this morning I pray that God places each one of you into a function, into a role of leadership, of influence in someone's life. You see, I believe and I teach that everyone has some leadership responsibility within the church because everyone has influence, and that's what leadership is, is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. You influence people by your life. Each one of us has some influence. Little Charity this morning, as we dedicated that baby, she has some influence. Did you know that? She can take Grandpa's finger and say, hey, Papa, let's go. And he follows. <laughs> to a reasonable extent. Because she has some influence. Each one of us has influence in somebody's life. And so I pray this morning as God puts you in those places of influence, when that happens, I pray today that you will resist the human urging, the human tendency to become dictatorial and controlling. Instead, be a servant leader and not a controlling and abusive leader. Because that's the kind of leadership God desires in His kingdom. Listen to Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. It's talking about Jesus here. It says, Who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. This very God of very God, who Jesus was, this very God of very God, could take the form of a servant. Serv uh, a servant. Who do you think you and I are that we refuse to be servants ourselves? We must emulate Jesus. 
You see, Jesus is the epitome of servant leadership. Jesus is our example of how to do Christian ministry in a Christian or a Christ-like way. Look at Luke chapter 22. Jesus, of course, after he had just got through kneeling and washing their feet, Jesus had this to say to his disciples. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. That's pretty emphatic, isn't it? There's no wiggle room in that, is there? You are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest. And the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater? The one who is at the table or the one who serves? Of course, in their minds, they say, oh, the greater person is the one who sits at the table. Then Jesus says this. Is it not the one who is at the table, but I am among you as one who serves? You ought to be waiting on me because I'm the greatest. And yet I'm the one who has taken the position of a servant. This was the, not just the diagonal the waiter on tables. This was a Dumas, the most lowly servant in the household, the one who washed people's feet. Jesus was saying, I have taken the very lowest position among you to show you this is where true leadership begins. You see, Jesus here is not making a mere suggestion to his church. This is a command. When he says, but you are not to be like that, that is a command. The Lord of the church is telling his church how leadership can be carried out. And I believe Jesus emphasized this so strongly. I believe Jesus gave them this example because he knew how difficult, how hard it was going to be for us. You see, our fallen Adamic nature, the, the nature we receive from our first human pair, that fallen nature rebels against servanthood. We want recognition. We want appreciation. We want a little prestige. We want a name badge that says who I am. But to be only a servant doesn't guarantee any of that. If we take the servanthood route, we're not guaranteed recognition or applause or, 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 or worldly fame. We're simply and only a servant. It makes no difference what the world thinks about us. It. it makes no difference whether we get recompensed, recompensed for our efforts and our, and, and our energies. It doesn't make any difference at all. We're doing it because we are servants to God. Only a servant. I've got a reason for preaching this this morning. Because you see, when it comes to building the church, motivation is everything. Why we do what we do sets us apart from the world. We're going to talk about motivation in just a minute. But notice what Paul says about his role and Apollos' role and then God's role in building the church. 1 Corinthians 3, 6-9. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. Dear friends, as you look back over the history of Wasilla Assembly of God, please realize that the good things that have been done here in the past were not done in vain. Amen. Many have planted. Many have watered. And my job over the last few months has been to 
water the good seed of the past and hopefully to plant some good seed for the present and hopefully for the future. But, beloved, only God can make it grow. He's the only one. The success, the future of this church is not dependent upon a person of the past, the present, or even the future. It's dependent upon God. Because only God can make it grow. But i got news for you. God is faithful. Hallelujah. He's faithful. He is the Lord of the harvest. And I believe God will bring a harvest to this valley. And I believe He plans to use this church to help bring about that great harvest. Amen. The future of this church, as I said, is not dependent upon man past, present, or future. However, God does have a man or a woman prepared to come and plant and water and be a servant leader so that this house can continue to make things grow for this world. I declare that to be so this morning. And then notice that Paul likens the church to both a field and a building. You know, as a field, as God's field, our primary duty as a field is to be receptive of the seed. That's our primary duty as a field, to be receptive of the seed. You know, that's the main emphasis of the parable of the sower and the seed that Jesus talked about in Matthew 13. That he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. And he was scattering, as he was scattering the seed, some fell among, along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly but because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. As God's field, we have got to be good soil, receptive of the seed. Some seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. This morning, if you have ears and you're sitting in this building, I declare to you that our job as a field is to receive the good seed of the Word of God and let that seed take root down deep into our soul and then allow God to bless it, allow somebody to water it by their preaching of the Word, but then allow God to bless it. And from that will come a harvest, a hundred, a sixty, or thirty-fold harvest that nobody in the world can keep from happening because God has ordained it for this place. Amen! Almost feel like having a Jericho march. That's an old timer, isn't it, brother? Old, old time things we used to do. But I believe it to be so. God has ordained it to be so. God's work cannot lie. If we act as good soil, God will produce. Hallelujah. Amen. And you know, Jesus then explains how we must be receptive of the seed in Matthew 13, 23. He says, but the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man, and I might add the woman, who hears the word and understands it. Good soil listens carefully to the word and then asks the Holy Spirit to make it clear to him or her what the word is saying and then allows that word to take deep root in their soul so that the harvest can come. He or she produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was said. You see, it's not the preacher. It's not the sower of the Word that's important. Rather, if the sower sows the pure and unencumbered Word of God, then what is, is important is how you and I receive it and how we allow it to change our lives and produce the spiritual harvest within us. That's our job as God's field. But Paul also says that we are a building. 
And as a building, we must make sure of a solid foundation in our lives. And that quality material is used in the building process. Notice what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 11. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder. And someone else is building on it. But each one, individually, each one, should be careful how he or she builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. A good building has to have a good foundation. And may I declare this morning, we have the very best foundation of all. Hallelujah. Hear these words from Peter, 1 Peter 2 and 6. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in Him will never be put to shame. Hallelujah. We have a good foundation. This is what Jesus said about our foundation. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 25. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. Hallelujah. Let the storms of life come. Let the winds of adversity blow. Let the world do everything that it can against us. It doesn't matter because our foundation is the rock of ages. Jesus is a rock in a weary land. When the dust of this old world life has settled, when everything else is, is, is laid by and everything else is done, when the dust has settled, our foundation stands strong and secure because Jesus is our rock today. Hallelujah. Amen. So every building has to have a strong foundation. Let's make sure our spiritual house today is founded on the rock called Jesus. But as a building, God expects more than just the foundation. He expects a superstructure to be built on that foundation. And that superstructure must be pleasing to Him. So Paul says that each one should be careful how he builds. In other words, there's a right way and a wrong way to build a spiritual house. And in the next few verses of 1 Corinthians 3, it seems that Paul is referring to how to both build our individual spiritual houses and how we can also build a corporate spiritual house called the church. So let's listen carefully to what Paul says. Chapter 3, verses 11 through 15, 1 Corinthians. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the fires. You see, in order to build a spiritual house worthy of the Lord's approval, we have to begin with the right foundation, the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But upon that foundation, we must build a superstructure, and Paul indicates that we have a choice of building material. Some eternal and some temporal. Gold, silver, and costly stones are building materials that not only will survive the fire, will, be, will, will become more precious and more refined by the fire. Wood, hay, and straw will be consumed by the fire. So you see, Paul is contrasting here the valuable and the worthless. He is contrasting building out of a desire to glorify God or building out of a desire to do just enough to get by. You 
see, beloved, when it comes to being fully Christian in a pagan world, motive is everything. Can I suggest this morning that you can do the right things for the wrong reasons and it's worth nothing? Did you hear that? You can do the right things for the wrong reasons and it's worth nothing. But don't just take my word for it. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and, and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil one. You see, when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15, His work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If if what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flame. What I believe Paul is referring to here is the judgment seat of Christ. Paul describes this judgment seat in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now, the judgment seat of Christ, which is also known in Scripture as the Bema judgment, is a judgment of the believers to determine their eternal reward. Only believers will appear at this judgment. No sinners. No ungodly. Only believers. And this judgment seat is not to determine whether one goes to eternal life or eternal damnation. If you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you have already passed from judgment into life. That's already done. That's already determined. Notice what John 5, 24 says. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. If you believed in Jesus, if you believed the true report, if you cast all of your confidence upon Jesus, if you've asked Him to become your Savior and to forgive you of your sin, you have already passed from judgment. You were found guilty but forgiven. Hallelujah. Now you pass into eternal life. He will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. So our eternity is already secured because of our, our relationship with Jesus. So that's not what the judgment seat of Christ is for. But rather, sometime after the rapture of the church, and if you want to know more about this, take the Axom course on, on eschatology. I teach all about this in that course. But sometime after the rapture of the church, each one of us, as believers, will stand before this judgment seat to receive our eternal reward based upon whether we built out of gold, silver, precious stones, or out of wood, hay, or straw. Now, some may say this morning, but, but, but preacher, we're not saved by works, so why are we to be judged by works? But remember, beloved, while it's true that we are not saved by works, we are saved to work. You're not saved to sit on the pew and do nothing. You're saved to do something for the kingdom of God to glorify Jesus. We are saved to work, and our works should bring glory to God. Hallelujah. You see, good works done with right motives glorify God. And these are the gold, the silver, and the precious stones that will result in us hearing Jesus, the Lord of the church, say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy that the Lord has prepared for you. And you know, that's what I want everybody in this assembly this morning to hear. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. (laughs) You'll forgive me for being a little uh, humorous. 
I've often told people, everybody's going to say, here, well done. And you're going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, or well done, he's, he's done on that side, turn him over. We're all going to hear it. But I want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Enter thou into that which the Lord has prepared for you. Now, some people say, well, well, okay, we, we receive this reward. Which Paul talks about running for, a, for a, 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 an incorruptible crown. Do you know what you're going to do with that crown once you receive it? Once he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant, you know what you're going to do with that? You're going to lay it at his feet. Because it's not about us. It's all about him. And he receives all the glory. Amen? So let's run for that crown. Let's strive to make sure that at the judgment seat we hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Philippians chapter 3. Paul says, Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do. Forgetting what is behind and straining to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You see, that's the finish line. That's the goal of being completely Christian in a pagan world, of making sure we finish well, of making sure we build out of gold, silver, and precious things. But building out of inferior materials and building with improper motives, that wood, hay, and straw, that results in great loss. Several years ago, I had an evangelist who uh, preached a sermon called Tears in Heaven. He based it upon the passage that we're looking at right now. Now, when he announced his title, Tears in Heaven, I, perhaps like some of you sitting here today, reacted by thinking, but that's not Scripture. The Bible says that God will wipe all tears from our eyes. Evangelist, what do you mean, tears in heaven? But the evangelist went on and explained what he meant. And it made great sense. For you see, if you and I have not done our very best at times, if you and I have not built out of, out of good motives and proper material, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we watch some or perhaps even much of our life's work go up in flames because we built out of inferior material and we built out of improper motives, when we watch that go up in flames, I believe we will shed some tears because we did not do our very best. Now, Paul says that those who suffer the loss of wood, hay, and stubble will be saved, but notice what it says in 1 Corinthians 3, 14 and 15. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, wood, hay, straw, he will suffer loss. And we're talking about the judgment seat of Christ. We're talking about standing before the Lord of the universe and watching Him evaluate our work. And if it, if it burns up, that's lost. And we're going to feel that loss. He Himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. See, I think the evangelist was right. I think that there will be some tears in heaven because we didn't always do our very best. God will wipe those tears from us. Isn't that what the Scripture says? That He will wipe away all the tears from our eyes? Well, guess what? If He wipes them away, they had to be there in the first place. And I think knowing that we did not do the very best we could with the right motives will cause some tears. He'll wipe them away. 
to say it's okay. But I think we'll suffer the loss. You say, preacher, why do you want to preach this thing to us? Because I don't want us to have tears in heaven. If there's any tears, I want to be tears of joy. I want us to be able to stand before Him with, with gold, silver, and precious stones and lay them at His feet and say, I did my best and I did it for the right reasons and I want you to know that I glorify you and I glorified you in my life on earth. That's the reason I preach things like this. Plus, Paul told the church of Corinth about these things. You see, the bottom line is this. Let's minimize the tears in heaven by doing our very best for His glory by keeping our motives very pure. So how do we become completely Christian in a pagan world? Well, part of it is we help Jesus build His church with good doctrine, good works, and right motives. See, anything less than that is good pay. Church, the day is coming, and I don't think it's too far off. But God is going to bring someone to give you long term leadership, vision, and pastoral care. But don't let pride or fear or things in the past hinder you from accepting what God is going to may not look exactly like you think it should look on the surface at the beginning. It may necessitate you swallowing a little pride of the past and saying, God will humble ourselves now for your future. And it may necessitate you stepping out in faith and accepting what God is doing. But whatever you do, Wood, don't use wood, hay, and straw. But use gold, silver, and precious stones. And whatever you do, do it because of the right motives. Because from that, God can build a spiritual house that this valley will be able to look at and say, God dwells there. Those people know God. And if you lift Jesus up, I believe this valley will be drawn to Jesus. Amen? So my prayer for you this morning, if you stand with me and bow your hearts and your heads, my prayer is that God will help us to do good works with right motives so that Jesus can receive the glory. Father, I thank you today that your word is quick and powerful and sharper any two-edged sword. It pierces deep within us. Sometimes, Father, it cuts us to the quick. Sometimes it separates some of the things that we thought was right, and we all, all of a sudden see, Lord, that maybe we've been doing it for wrong motives and out of wrong reason. And Father, I pray this morning that as this church moves forward, that everything that they do, everything that they say, everything that they think, every action that they enable, Father, I pray that it will be done because of pure motive, and I pray, Father, that it will be with the building stones of gold and silver and precious stones. Father, I feel compelled this morning, in, in this moment, to pray for the person that you are preparing. Father, I pray this morning that as you prepare this person, you will give him or her special insight, special understanding to know how to function, facilitate this work in this battle for long-term success. And then, Father, I pray for every person standing here that's a part of this church. I pray for you to work in each heart, in each life, and begin to prepare each one to have faith, Father, I thank you today that one day whenever we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we 
to lift our heads up and look upon your glory and say, Lord, I feel like I did my best. I feel like I did it all from the right motive. Now, Father, I thank you that you have allowed me to stand in the presence of Jesus and to hear him say, well done, thank you. I pronounce blessing. I pronounce peace. I pronounce glory. I pronounce success. I pronounce strength on this congregation. And in the days ahead, I pronounce that your will will be done. Would you pray with me this morning?